this is one of my favorite lectures in this course because it's a story and I'm going to tell it to you as a story of how things came to be as we understand them now. It's a really, really interesting story. It's about transformation mostly, a little bit about oncogenesis and it all really starts with this quote which you will see by the end is so right. This has to do with something else. But the cause is in there to begin with and you'll see that with transformation today. So I want to start with an experiment. And we take an embryo, we chop it up, make single cells, and we put them in culture. And when you plate them out, the cells grow nicely. And if you look at them under the microscope down on the left, they look normal. The cells grow, they touch one another, they stop growing, they form a nice monolayer. You can split this and propagate the cells maybe 20 or 30 times and then they die. This is what happens with normal differentiated cells. Now, if instead you, before plating these cells out, you treat them in some way, you irradiate them with a mutagen mutagenic light like UV light, or you treat them with a mutagenic chemical, and then plate them out, you will get some colonies of cells like this one here. And if you look at them under the microscope, they're very different. The cells are piled up on one another, they're morphologically different, and as you'll see, they have different requirements. We call these transformed. And these have been transformed by the procedure, chemical or UV, whatever. But they have very different growth properties, and one of them is that they will live forever. They are immortal. So we've known about transformation of cells for many, many years. We know that they grow, they have very different properties from normal cells. That is, that take your embryo and, and plate out cells, uh, they're very different. They grow forever, and one of the first immortal human cell lines made was HeLa cells from Henrietta Lacks. We talked very briefly about that story right at the beginning of the course. They have lost anchorage dependence. They don't have to be attached to a monolayer. They can grow floating, or they can grow in agar, actually. If you put, suspend them in agar, they will grow very well, whereas non-transformed cells were not. They have lost contact inhibition, so they pile up on one top of each other. So cells normally, when they sense each other, they stop growing, they don't pile up. They've lost contact inhibition, and they have decreased requirements for growth factors. So typically primary cells, you have to put a lot of serum in the medium. Transformed cells have a decreased requirement, okay? So that's transformed cells. They are different from tumor cells. A tumor is a very different beast. Of course, oncogenesis, which is part of the title of this lecture, is the development of cancer. The cancer is a tumor. It is a collection of cells that grow rapidly, uncontrollably, invade normal tissues. Cancer is a genetic disease. It is caused by mutations in various genes that control the regulation of cell growth and so forth. And these mutations are on top of the ones that cause transformation, as you will see today. The mutations that cause a cancer can be inherited from your parents. They can be caused by mutagens, chemical carcinogens, or uh, irradiation from too much sunlight. Uh, or they can happen spontaneously. As our DNA replicates, we accumulate mutations, as you know. And if they happen to be in the wrong genes, you could develop a cancer. And we think right now you need about a dozen mutations and very key genes in order uh, to produce a cancer. So a, a cancer, a tumor, is very different from a transformed cell. So on the left is our normal monolayer of cells and our transformed monolayer. And on the right is a mouse with a tumor. So the, you need a certain number of changes to cause the transformed phenotype. We're going to explore this today in terms of how viruses can transform cells, but you should understand that you can use chemicals or irradiation and other ways to introduce mutations as well. This transformed cell, if you inject it into a mouse, could give rise to a tumor. It would require additional mutations to make a tumor such as that one. But not every transformed cell is tumorigenic. They are distinct processes. They are not one and the same. 
First we get transformation and they may lead to oncogenesis. We study virus-induced tumors because viruses, as you know, can be quite simple. You have X number of genes and you can figure out which viral genes are involved in transforming cells and giving them oncogenic potential. We don't talk about viruses actually causing cancer because they can't do everything. Viruses are associated with cancers because they will transform cells, but then the rest of the steps from the transformed cells to the tumor happens in us as the cells are multiplying. So one of the things you'll see today is that cells can transform cells and they become immortal, they grow forever. This is actually very bad. When cells divide forever, they accumulate mutations and that's how, that's one way that they can become oncogenic. Most of our cells don't keep dividing forever in us and there's a reason for that because that can lead to problems. So today we're going to explore how viruses cause cancers and there are a number of viruses in both RNA and DNA virus families that are known to cause cancers in various animals. You can see uh, the Flaviviridae hepatitis C virus, we talked about that last time. Uh, retroviruses are associated with cancers in many animals including humans and a bunch of DNA viruses like adenohepadna, hepatitis B virus, we talked about that, herpes viruses, papillomas and polyomaviruses, and even pox viruses. In humans, we think about 20% of human cancers have a viral etiology. So the virus transforms cells to begin with, the cells start dividing uncontrollably and they accumulate mutations that make them oncogenic. And these are the human viruses associated with human cancers, a lot of herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr virus, um, he hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C, human T lymphotropic virus 1, HIV 1, uh, human papilloma virus, and then HHV 8, human herpes virus 8, and Merkel cell polyoma virus. All right, so these are the viruses associated with human cancers so far. We're not going to talk about every one of them. In fact, we're going to talk about no virus today that causes a human cancer. But the principles I want to tell you using uh, animal models for cancer will uh, certainly apply to the human viruses as well. One thing you should remember throughout, transformation and malignancy, or transformation and oncogenesis if you wish from the title, neither is required for any virus to be able to replicate. And as you'll see, they are actually mistakes. They are errors, they are accidents. No virus requires these to replicate. So the story today starts in 1909. Uh, Dr. Peyton Rouse was a scientist here in New York City at the Rockefeller Institute. And as the story goes that a farmer brought him, a farmer from New Jersey or Long Island, depending on whose story, brought him a chicken with a tumor. And uh, this, as you'll see, is quite common to have tumors on chickens. But, uh, and Rouse uh, paid him for this chicken and started working on this tumor. And what he did is he took the tumor. Here's the chicken here with the, you can see uh, the tumor. It's a sarcoma, a solid tumor. He took it and he ground it up and he made a filtrate through a 0.2 micron filter. By now, 1909, we had discovered viruses. The idea of a virus had taken hold. And uh, he wanted to know if this could be caused by a virus. So he took the filtrate, that is everything that went through the filter from a tumor, injected it into another chicken, and lo and behold, he got tumors in those chickens. And he showed that cancer could be caused by a viral infection. He wasn't actually the first to show this, but as you will see, a few years earlier, uh, two scientists, Ellerman and Bang, had shown that leukemia could be caused by a virus, but People at the time didn't think leukemia was actually a cancer. They only thought solid tumors were cancers. So uh, Rouse gets credit for showing cancer can be caused uh, by a virus infection. So nobody believed Rouse for years. It took 50 years for this to really take hold, this idea in the 1950s, as you will see. And he actually did get the Nobel Prize. This is the longest incubation period, I think, for a Nobel Prize in 1966. <laughs> And what he leaves behind is this, his virus, Rouse sarcoma virus, okay? So he got it from a chicken, Rouse was his name, and it was a sarcoma. And this 
plays into two more Nobel Prizes, as you will see today. Now, there is a wonderful book about cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee, the Emperor of All Maladies. This won the Pulitzer Prize. Siddhartha is an oncologist at my place at Columbia. Anybody read this book? You like it? This is a great book. You should read it. All right, summer reading. This is fantastic. The guy is a brilliant writer. I mean, this guy's an oncologist. He's pretty busy. He wrote this while he was a resident. It's beautifully written, and the science is terrific. So I want to read you some passages, because he says this way better uh, than I can. By the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps. The virologists, led by Rouse, or Peyton Rouse, as we've just described, claimed that viruses caused cancer, although no such virus had been found in human studies. And it's true. For 50, 60 years, there were no viruses associated with human cancer. Epidemiologists argued that exogenous chemicals caused cancer, although they could not offer a mechanistic explanation. And you'll read in the book how the chimney sweeps in England, the young boys who fit down the chimney, they had higher incidences of scrotal tumors because the black stuff lining the fireplaces, the chimneys, is carcinogenic. So this was epidemiologic proof, but nobody had a mechanism. The third camp possessed weak circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. Something in the cell itself could cause the cancer. Okay. Howard Temin comes into the picture in 1951. You may remember we mentioned him before. A young virologist arrived at Caltech to study genetics of fruit flies. Restless and imaginative, he soon grew bored with fruit flies. <laughs> just, I just love it. Switching fields, he chose to study Rouse in Renato Dolbeco's laboratory. Does anybody remember who Renato Dolbeco is? What he did? Media. He made media. Dolbeco's medium, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> A little more uh, seminal. He developed the plaque assay for animal viruses. He was really into cells and using them. He caught on really quickly when cell culture was first developed, and he had it going in his laboratory. So Howard Temin went to him. Until the late 50s, Rouse had been shown to cause tumors only in live chickens. Temin imagined creating cancer in a petri dish. After seven years, he succeeded. So what did he do? He added Rouse virus to a layer of normal cells in a petri dish. He took chicken cells from a chicken embryo, just like that first experiment, made a monolayer of nice cells, then he put Rouse sarcoma virus on it. The infection incited them to grow uncontrollably, forcing them to form tiny distorted heaps containing hundreds of cells that he called foci. The foci, he reasoned, represented cancer distilled into its essential form, cells growing uncontrollably, unstoppably, pathological mitosis. All right, so Tamin was able to grow the virus in cell culture and show that it would make transformed cells, cells growing uncontrollably. And here's pictures of them at the bottom. These are avian cells transformed by Rouse sarcoma virus. Here is one focus of cells. You can see the monolayer around is normal. They're touching each other and they've stopped growing. And this is a transformed focus. They're piling up on each other. Here's a higher magnification. These are fusiform, they're elongated. It can be different shapes here, are some round ones that are also forming a focus. So the focus is caused by the virus. He showed that. All right, so for the first time, you start to get a handle on how virus is giving cells oncogenic potential. Now, after Temin's work, people found that you could also do this with DNA viruses. Remember, you haven't learned this yet, but uh, the virus, I don't think I've told you that yet, right? No, not yet. He, oh, sorry, here. These turned out to be, Rouse turned out to be an RNA virus, and he discovered reverse transcriptase in this virus. So Temin reasoned, he said, I put this virus on the cells and it permanently changes them. This is an RNA virus. There's no way this is happening, a permanent change, transformation, unless there's a DNA intermediate. And that's why he started looking for reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that copies RNA into DNA. Isn't that brilliant? He went from the, the observation, he said, there's got to be an enzyme that does this, and he found it. And he co-discovered reverse transcriptase in Rouse sarcoma virus, Nobel Prize number two for Peyton Rouse's virus. All right? So he showed that the DNA could stay in these cells. All right, so then, as I said, 
it's been discovered subsequently in uh, DNA viruses. You infect baby hamster kidney cells with polyoma virus. They, come, they become transformed. And uh, SV40, the virus we talked about quite a bit in terms of DNA replication, if you infect mouse cells, Swiss 3T3 or mouse cells, rare cells grew out as colonies, they're transformed. All right, and in each of these experiments, most of the cells die, and a few cells end up being transformed. Very rare, but they're transformed, and they have all the properties that we just talked about before. So the question is, how can a virus transform a cell and you need certain requirements in order to do this. First of all, the virus obviously can't kill the cell, right? If it kills the cell, it cannot live forever. That's so obvious that maybe we don't have to state it. The infected cell doesn't die. You have to reduce viral replication because transformed cells don't make virus particles. The ones transformed by Rouse sarcoma virus, the ones transformed by <coughs> polyoma or SV40, they don't make any virus particles. So they don't die and they don't make virus particles. And the cell obviously has to continue to divide. They're immortal. That's the one of the definitions of transformation. So three requirements for viruses transforming a cell. And this little bell here is to remind me to ask you, do these first two conditions ring a bell? Reduced cytopathic effects, reduced virus replication. It's a persistent infection, exactly. Transformation is a form of a persistent infection. Remember last time we talked about persistence where there's no cell killing, there's no virus particles produced, the virus genome is present. So that's what transformation is, a form of a persistent uh, infection. So that brings up the question, when we transform cells with viruses, RNA or DNA, what happens to the viral genome. And so people started looking at this. The tools were crude. You have to remember, 50s and 60s, we didn't have very much molecular biology. Tough to get answers. But what they found is that some of the cells have all or parts of the viral genome. Sometimes there was no viral genome in the cell. And this was completely puzzling to everyone. Nobody could figure out exactly what this meant. All right. Now, last time I told you that in cells persistently infected with herpes viruses, all your uh, peripheral ganglia with herpes viruses in the genomes are intact uh, in the nuclei of the neurons. But here, uh, these cells had parts or whole genomes or no genomes, and they all were transformed. So people were confused by these results. Okay, so before we go on, let's just make sure that uh, you understand this. And we have the first question up already. Which of the following is not a property of transformed cells? Number one, the jokers have returned. Welcome back <laughs> from, uh, from last time, Monday, I guess. Um, so uh, it, it's not increased requirements. It's just these transformed cells have decreased requirements for gross factors. You need to use less serum. And that, the reason for that will become burningly obvious to you in 20 minutes, okay? It will be totally clear. Uh, immortality, they are immortal transformed cells. They, they have lost anchorage dependent. They've lost contact inhibition. They do form colonies in semi-solid media. These are all properties of transformed cells. All right, so we have the basic observations. Both RNA viruses and DNA viruses can transform cells. Let's figure out how that happened and how we related to cancer. And this was a tough route because there were three different camps. Remember what Mukherjee said, three different camps working, people who thought viruses caused cancer, uh, people who, who found that DNA viruses caused cancer, and then people who, found, who thought that a chemical or something within this cell caused cancer. They were all independently working. In the 60s and 70s, their work all converged. And the result was, this is amazing, we can now understand how cell growth control works. We didn't know this before we started studying RNA and DNA tumor viruses. So we're going to start with the RNA viruses here, the, the Rouse uh, sarcoma virus, and try and understand how these transform cells. <clears throat> Turns out that every chicken, pretty much every chicken in the world, is infected with a virus called avian leukosis virus, ALV. No matter wh where the chicken is, you know, you go and buy a Frank Purdue chicken in the supermarket, 
it's got this virus in it. But fortunately for you, it doesn't infect people. This virus was discovered in 1908 by Ellerman and Bang. These guys proved that this virus caused leukemia or leukosis, different word, same disease. But people, as I said, didn't think that was a cancer, so there wasn't much interest in it. Most chickens get infected with the virus a few months uh, after they're born. 3% of birds develop leukemia after about 14 weeks. So this is a kind of slowly developing disease. It doesn't happen quickly. The rest of the birds, 97%, they get infected, they get a viremia, they make an immune response, they clear the infection. What kind of infection is that? Acute. acute. It's an acute infection. These guys get a persistent infection. Okay, what's going on here? So these birds that recover, even the ones that get leukemias, they can develop other kinds of tumors as they get older. Connective tissue tumors like sarcomas, which is what Rouse worked on. So Rouse studied one of these sarcomas in an older chicken, one that had developed a tumor after acquiring this virus, avian leukosis virus, shortly after birth. Um, you can, it turns out, as you will see in a moment, most of these viruses that cause these solid tumors are defective. And we will define what defective is, is in the moment. It turns out that Rouse was really lucky in his first isolate because he isolated a non-defective virus that could replicate it on his own. If he hadn't, who knows how much longer it would have taken to figure all this out. So we have two viruses so far. We have Rouse sarcoma virus, then we have the avian leukosis virus, two very different cancers, one of uh, white blood cells and one causing a solid tumor. What's the relationship between them? Well, it turns out to be figured out by these two gentlemen uh, in 1976, uh, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus. They were both University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and they found that, in fact, uh, RSV is a recombinant. RSV, which comes from a solid tumor, is a recombinant virus. It is basically ALV with a piece of cellular DNA, chicken DNA, inserted into the viral genome. So Rouse is ALV with a piece of cellular DNA. And these guys showed that it was a piece of cellular DNA. They called it VSARC, S-R-C for sarcoma. This is a normal cellular gene that has been picked up by ALV to make it RSV, to make it cause sarcomas. And they got the Nobel Prize in 1989 third Nobel Prize for Rouse's virus, yes. How does the transient viremia prevent leukosis? You, it says that the transient viremia makes the chickens immune to leukosis. So uh, the 90 percent of the chickens get a transient viremia and they make an immune response, they clear the infection. In very rare animals, 3 percent, they get leukemia. I, I think you have to wait to hear the rest of the lecture to understand why leukemia is rare. So most of the time, the infection is just an acute infection, but persistent occurs, uh, uh, transformation occurs later for reasons that will become obvious. So here's this made one of the major insights that resulted from this. So I've already told you this. Birds that are infected with ALV uh, develop a variety of tumors. If you take a tumor from different birds, you will find different viruses in them. And this is what people did over the years. Uh, they took different kinds of birds that developed different solid tumors. They isolated virus with them. They are all able to induce solid tumors in recipient animals. The viruses were all different, and they were all defective. They lacked viral genes needed to replicate. Why that is, we'll show you in a moment. That's why Rouse was lucky, because he just picked the first one up, and it was non-defective. And everybody after him got defective viruses. So every retrovirus or every Rouse-related virus that gave him different names because Rouse got to only name his had picked up a different oncogene from the cell. Rouse's had picked up SARC and the others picked up different oncogenes. And this was a gold mine. All of a sudden we had dozens of cellular genes which apparently if you put them in a retrovirus could cause transformation and eventually cancer. And this is a picture of some of the proviruses from these uh, viruses isolated from 
chickens on the left. So on the top here is uh, avian leukosis virus. This is the original Bang and Ellerman virus that causes leukemia after a long time, after 14 weeks in chickens. And you look, you can see this is a typical retrovirus, two LTRs, the blue on either end, and we have gag, pol, and envelope genes. So this virus is non-defective, it can replicate in cells, it has all the genes that it needs. Right below it is Rouse sarcoma virus, gag, pol, envelope, two LTRs, and look, it has an extra gene, it has the SARC gene, which again is a chicken gene, which we'll talk about shortly. So this virus has everything it needs to replicate. It's just inserted something extra from the cell. So this is why it is not defective. Now here below it are all the other viruses isolated from bird with tumors over subsequent years. And you can see they are defective. They're missing gag pole envelope or some combination. So look at this one here. Uh, this one has a little bit of gag, but it's missing pole and envelope. And you can see, just going down here, every one of these is missing something. These are three essential genes, gag, pole, and env. If you miss just a bit of one of them, you're not going to replicate. So that's why all these viruses are defective. Somehow in picking up, and by the way, you can see they all have different oncogenes, FIPS, MIB, MIC, YES, JUNE, ERB, etc. They're all given three-letter names. They're all different, and they've all resulted in the deletion of virus sequences. So they're defective, and that's why I say Rouse was lucky. It's really amazing that he was able to do that because we didn't understand this defective issue until many years later. So here's defective versus defective in case you don't understand it. Defective viruses are missing some part of the viral genome, like FIPS from this particular uh, tumor, and the only way you can grow it is in the presence of a helper virus, which would be avian leukosis virus, or even Rouse if you wanted to, but that would be experimentally a little messy. So you could put uh, avian leukosis virus together with this and it would grow. In fact, most of the stocks of these defective viruses turned out to have ALV in them, which is why people could isolate them in the first place. So in the process of picking up an oncogene from the cell, they lose some viral genes. That's why uh, they are defective. So this is called oncogene capture. These retroviruses, remember retroviruses are RNA viruses. They make a DNA copy when they infect the cell. And what happens to that DNA copy? It gets integrated, and then it's called a provirus, right, when it's integrated. So that should ring a bell. Integration, it could integrate anywhere in the genome, and if it goes next to an oncogene, that could be a problem. Yes? Does this insight uh, from the viral mechanism of creating this oncogenesis, uh, does it, did it help us uh, understand that our genome contains lots of retrotransposons and transposons. Did this insight actually lead us to discovering those retrotransposons and lines and signs and everything? Um, I think it was more complicated than that. First, there was genetic evidence. Uh, many strains of animals, like mice, have lots of endogenous retroviruses. They produce viruses, so it was easy to detect that. Uh, in our genome, we have lots, but we don't produce viruses, so we missed it until we could look for the sequences in some way. So it was really not just this, but a lot of other investigation as well. So the, here's, a, here's just one mechanism for capturing an oncogene, okay? And these are normal cellular genes. They're, as you will see, these oncogenes, in fact, people kind of don't like calling them oncogenes because normally they're not causing any tumor. They're regulating the growth of our cells. So here's an oncogene right here, and the provirus is integrating. Viral DNA is integrating into it, and here are the two LTRs. You're going to make wild-type viral RNA. Um, and there's a terminator for transcription in the right-hand LTR, so usually the transcripts end there. But sometimes this LTR gets mutated. In this example, it's actually been deleted along with the envelope gene, so random deletions do occur. And so now you get a transcript that includes the oncogene sequence, which is downstream of where the virus has integ integrated. And so now you can make uh, a viral mRNA with some oncogene fused to the rest of the viral open reading frame. And during reverse transcription, you know, the enzyme goes back and forth between the two copies of uh, RNA. So this is a particle with an oncogene containing RNA and a wild-type RNA. And eventually you can reverse transcribe upon infection 
uh, and deliver that oncogene to the next cell. So here's Gagpol, Sark, that's, or this is onc, and this will now transform the next cell. The uh, expression of that oncogene in an un unregulated fashion will now transform the cell. So we now know over 60 different oncogenes. We call them proto-oncogenes to show that in the cell they are not causing tumors. Uh, you have to have something done to them in order to cause tumors. You have to overexpress them or, or mutate them, which happens when some retroviruses pick them up. All of these genes are involved in cell growth control. They're highly regulated because growth of our cells, division, has to be regulated. Otherwise, you have problems. You can develop cancers. <coughs> the nomenclature, the cellular genes, the proto-oncogenes, have a C in front of them for cellular. And then onks, for example, SARC, C-SARC is the gene that Rouse sarcoma virus picked up. When Rouse sarcoma virus has it now, it's called V-SARC. So when the virus has these oncogenes in them, you put a V in front of it. Otherwise, it's the same name. Now, sometimes the gene is the same, and, and the simple fact of overexpressing it in a retrovirus genome is enough to transform the cell. Other times, the oncogene mutates, which also activates it. And what this means, you'll see uh, in a moment. Now, these greater than 60 oncogenes revealed a complete pathway of cell growth control that we were totally unaware of. We knew bits here and there, but this was unprecedented. Again, by studying different sarcoma-causing viruses from birds, and I should also mention, eventually, people isolated these from mammals of all sorts, from mice and different kinds of uh, mammals. They could isolate viruses that would transform cells and picked up oncogenes as well. So it's not something restricted to birds. Studying those uh, oncogenes picked up revealed this whole um, pathway of growth control. So on this diagram on the left here, this is a diagram of the cell, and it shows some of the oncogenes along a pathway of cell growth control. This is the mitogenic stimulation pathway. In other words, you have a cell and you add a growth factor to it, like what's in serum. Serum contains lots of growth factors. The cells start dividing. That is because the growth factors bind to a receptor. There is then a signal transduction pathway triggered, which involves phosphorylation of various intermediates. Transcription proteins go in the nucleus and turn on a bunch of genes that tell the cell, divide. There's good stuff out in the medium. You can start dividing. We discovered this whole pathway from transforming retroviruses. And these letters are names of oncogenes that were identified in retroviruses. For example, SARC. There's SARC picked up in Rouse sarcoma virus. This is a membrane-bound protein kinase. It's part of the signaling pathway leading to mitogenic stimulation. We also have growth factors themselves can be oncogenes. The receptors can be oncogenes. The G proteins, the cytoplasmic protein kinases, the nuclear proteins that are involved in telling the cell to divide, every one of those was picked up as an oncogene. Because if you overexpress it in a retrovirus, you will make the cell divide. So let's, let's take an example. Let's say a retrovirus has picked up the cis oncogene. This retrovirus infects the cell. Now it makes a ton of cis. The cis binds to the receptor and makes the cell divide. Uncontrolled expression. Now you can also have mutations in these growth factors. For example, you can have uh, mutations in any of these uh, oncogenes involved intracellularly that make them on constitutively. All right, so you have a kinase that depends on getting a signal from an upstream protein. You now have a mutation in it that makes it signal all the time without its upstream indication. So these mutations do accumulate in retroviruses which have error-prone uh, RNA polymerases, as you know. And so that's another mechanism for uncontrolled growth. So this makes perfect sense. Remember, the original phenotype picked up in cells that tamin infected with Rouse, which were transformed as uncontrolled growth. It makes perfect sense. He put SARC in with that virus, and you put SARC, and then you turn on the rest of the pathway without having a growth factor present. That's why you need reduced growth factors to grow these transformed cells, because they're stimulating themselves. They are basically growing and dividing continuously. Every 24 hours, these cells divide. As they do so, they accumulate mutations. 
and eventually you get enough mutations so that that transformed cell becomes oncogenic. If it's in an animal, uh, it can cause a tumor. All right, so this uh, brings us to the cell cycle. We can now interpret these results in terms of the cell cycle. Now you know cells go through a phase where they make things and then they divide. They make things and divide. And they're divided into specific phases. Here we have uh, mitosis, the little phase up in purple at the top. Here's when the cells actually divide. After they divide, there's a resting phase. And then there's the S or the synthetic phase where they make proteins, they duplicate their DNA, another resting phase, and then they divide. This cell cycle, as you might guess, is under very careful control, which involves the mitogenic pathway that we've just talked about. You add a growth factor to cells, it signals through this pathway to the nucleus, and that starts mitosis. It sends cells through division at G0. So all these oncogenes or proto-oncogenes that have been identified in RNA tumor viruses act right up here at G0. They push the cell forward. Whether they be homologs of growth factors or growth factor receptors or intracellular uh, signaling cascades or nuclear proteins, every one of those pushes the cell through the cycle. So we call them dominant oncogenes because you produce them in cells, they have a phenotype. Right? They're all, this whole thing, this whole control of the cell cycle, starting from the GO signal up here, G0, was revealed by studying these retroviruses. Okay, so now I think you can understand um, why these cells get transformed. I think you can understand what we learned from identifying these oncogenes, again, in birds and mice and other animals uh, in which viruses cause tumors. Retroviruses transform cells by three mechanisms. I now want to sort all this out into three distinct mechanisms and show you the molecular basis for this. There are those that cause rapid tumor formation within two weeks. Like Rouse sarcoma virus, you inject it into a chicken, within two weeks you have a solid tumor. That's because Rouse has picked up a dominant oncogene that kicks the cells into dividing continuously. Right? It, it has picked this up from the cell, when the virus infects, it expresses it immediately. So that's why you have rapid tumor formation. Then you have uh, RNA tumor viruses with intermediate kinetics like avian leukosis virus. Remember, it takes at least 14 weeks to get leukemia in chickens infected with ALV. These viruses do not pick up an oncogene from the cell. What they do is they integrate the proviral DNA next to an oncogene and turn it on. Their right-hand LTR acts as a promoter to turn on the oncogene downstream. And this involves some deletion of the, of the sequences so that there's no termination uh, by, by cellular sequences, so it takes a little bit longer. So again, no dominant oncogene, rather inserting next to one. That's called cis activation. And then we have retroviruses that take years to transform cells and cause tumors like human T lymphoma, uh, lymphocytic virus, HTLV1 and 2. They have no oncogene. They do not insert next to an oncogene. What they do is they produce transcriptional activators that they need for their own gene expression, and those happen to activate oncogenes that are in the cell. All right, so those are being uh, activated in trans by a viral regulatory protein. And here are those three diagrammed for you so you can understand them. We have the transducing retroviruses that rapidly transform cells. They've picked up an oncogene. So there's uh, Rouse sarcoma virus, for example. The cis-activating retroviruses, which have intermediate incubation to tumor formation. And they integrate next to an oncogene. So here's the oncogene the provirus is next to it. Its transcription is being driven by the LTR. And finally, we have transactivating viruses, which don't pick up an oncogene. They don't in insert next to one, but rather they make, in this case, it's called protein X, a transcriptional activator that they need to drive their own transcription. And this happens to turn on cellular genes in an inappropriate way. It turns on cellular genes that, whose products make cells divide and cause them to be transformed. Now the readout here, rapid, intermediate, slow, 
This is tumor formation. What all the virus is doing is transforming the cells. I want you to remember that. The virus isn't causing a cancer. It is transforming the cells. They start to multiply uncontrollably, and then mutations accumulate that lead to the formation of a tumor. The virus does not cause the actual tumor itself. So this is all a mistake. Transformation and tumor formation by RNA tumor viruses is a mistake. It's a byproduct of the fact that they have to integrate. When you integrate into a genome, then there's a good chance that you're going to cause some havoc. Okay? There is no obvious requirement for the virus to transform cells or to cause a tumor. Now on this slide I have mammalian transforming. Now, I used to give this lecture and say there's no need for any uh, RNA tumor virus to transform or cause cancer. And then I got an email from someone who works on the virus that causes this tumor. Uh, this is a walleye, it's a kind of fish, and this is a dermal sarcoma, and that's caused by uh, walleye dermal sarcoma retrovirus. And it happens in most newborn fish in the wild, and it happens at a certain time of year. And then when the fish congregate to mate, the tumors fall off, and the virus gets in the water and infects new fish. Okay, so you need the tumor to spread the infection. In this case, not in, not in the mammalian case, but I just learned of this, that apparently for this fish retrovirus, the way it's spread is to induce this tumor that falls off. The fish swim off, they're fine. They don't have any untoward effects, uh, and new fish are infected. And this happens again every year when the fish congregate and the tumors fall into the water. So if they didn't make a tumor, maybe the virus wouldn't be transformed. Okay, let's see what we learned here. Which of the following allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells? I understand the um, ten answers downstream. So the answer is the presence of a SARC gene. That is what transforms cells. Um, now I understand why some of you said presence of LTRs because the upstream LTR, of course, drives the expression of the SARC gene, but it is ultimately the, <coughs> bless you, the SARC gene itself that is transforming the cells. You don't need an envelope gene, you don't need a Paul. In fact, those are often deleted in many of these defective retroviruses. Um, you just need, you need the SARC gene. All right, so that took care of uh, RNA. Now let's look at the DNA virus story and then we'll see how it all converged. First DNA tumor virus discovered was a papillomavirus that causes warts or papilloma. Papilloma is another name for a wart. And rabbits. These were discovered in wild rabbits. So here are two photographs of the papillomas on these guys. They're okay. They fall off and they're, they're fine. They're not harmed. This guy doesn't look very happy though, right? Now, have you ever heard of a jackalope? So this is the jackalope. People used to see these weird rabbits. They thought they were hybrids of rabbits and antelopes. Uh, well, they are rabbits with uh, huge papillomas that look like horns. And nothing more. This is caused by a DNA tumor virus, papillomavirus, small double-stranded DNAs. In, in uh, mice, Ludwig Gross discovered a mouse polyomavirus in 1953. The natural host of this virus is the mouse. Uh, it doesn't cause any tumors in mice, but if you infect other animals, like hamsters, rats, and rabbits, you will get tumors in those, ants, in those animals. So first clue, something interesting is going on. When you infect the wrong host, you get a tumor. Polyomaviruses, SV40 was discovered as a contaminant of the early poliovirus vaccines, uh, both the killed, uh, the inactivated, and the infectious vaccines. And it was found that this virus induces rare tumors in newborn hamsters. That's not the host of this virus. This is a monkey virus. It doesn't cause tumors in monkeys. It doesn't transform monkey cells in cultures. But in the wrong host, SV40 will cause tumors. And by the way, many, many Americans received this virus. And uh, there's a lot of controversy o over whether it caused tumors in people. But probably it didn't. You can read about that in the textbook. OK, so here's a summary of, of what I've told you in terms of 
permissivity. Permissivity, remember, when a virus gets into a cell, whether it can replicate or not. So SV40, the monkey, monkey cells are permissive. They, make, they get infected, they make virus particles. Um, SV40 in the mouse is non-permissive. Nothing happens, no gene expression. But in hamsters and rats, it is, they are semi-permissive. That means you get only early gene expression. Remember the temporal delineation of gene expression in DNA viruses. Semi-permissive means only early gene expression. You don't get late proteins, you don't get virions assembled. Those are the animals in which SV40 forms tumors, the ones where you have a semi-permissive infection. Mouse polyomavirus uh, in the mouse is permissive, no tumors. Non-permissive in monkeys, so no tumors. The virus doesn't even <coughs> express its genes. But again, in hamster and rat cells are semi-permissive for mouse polyoma, and in those cases you get tumors. So something interesting is, is developing here. Now this transformation is very rare. You get at one in 100,000 infected cells transform. So if you take in this experiment, a polyomavirus, again, are infecting the wrong species, not the species of origin, one transfer cell per 100,000. So why is it rare? Why is transformation rare? And does that have anything to do with the fact that in animals, tumor formation is pretty rare also. All right, before we answer that, let me tell you about another family of DNA viruses that can cause tumors. These are the adenoviruses, larger DNA-containing viruses. There are many serotypes that infect humans. They do not cause tumors in people, but in the wrong host, they will cause tumors. You can see they cause tumors in hamsters. They will transform hamster cells in culture. They will cause tumors. But like polyomas and papillomas, the transformation and the tumor formation is rare. So certain things are coming up now all the time. So people couldn't really figure out what this means until someone discovers, a number of people discovered what are called T or tumor antigens. They found by studying cells transformed in culture and tumors from animals that had been infected with these viruses that developed tumors, they all expressed at minimum one virus protein. So they called it the T antigen or tumor antigen. So the T antigen that we talked about a while ago, which is important for SV40 replication, that was discovered because the proteins expressed in tumors. So in SV40, we have large T and small t. Polyomas, large, middle, and small. Papillomas, they're called E5, E6, and E7. And they're encoded in adenovirus in the E1A and E1B gene. The the important thing here is that they are tumor antigens. They're expressed in tumors and in transformed cells. And every one of these proteins is different. There's no homology. SV40T is different from polyoma, from papilloma, and adeno, et cetera. So this was a really important discovery, but people really didn't uh, understand what it meant. These T antigens are needed by the viruses. They are essential viral genes. You need them for replication. If you take them out of the genome, the virus does not replicate. They need it for DNA synthesis, SV40 T antigen. Remember, large T binds the origin of replication and helps melt it so the polymerase can get in. It's needed for transcription. We talked a little bit about that. These are the, the genes encoding these T antigens, not just SV40, but adeno and papilloma, are the only ones that are found in tumor cells and transformed cells. And in fact, if you take the T antigen gene of SV40 and put it in a cell, you can transform it. So if you wanted to make a cell line from cells inside your cheek, you could put them in, in a culture dish and put SV40 T antigen in them. They would become immortalized, and then you could have a cell line of your very own that would grow forever, and people do this all the time. You can take any of these uh, T antigens. They alone are enough to transform cells. T antigens are what? I just realized I didn't tell you one of the bits of information here that you need to know to answer this question. <laughs> so let's see how you did in the absence of that. Uh, you got all of the above anyway, good. Um, so T antigens are encoded by viral genes, they're essential. They are present in tumors and transformed cells. They're encoded by viral genes that in transformed cells they're incorporating the genome. They're the only ones that are expressed in those cells. And what I didn't tell you is that they're antagonists of cell cycle checkpoints. So 
Uh, it's all of the above. We're going to talk about this right now, in fact. Now, to put all this together, so people had transformed cells by a variety of DNA tumor viruses in the wrong host. They were rare. They had T antigens in all of them. Still didn't make sense. And then three different lines of investigation provided the information needed. And the first was a protein called P53 was found to bind SV40 T antigen. It's called P53. It's a very famous protein now, but it was originally discovered because it binds SV40 T. Next, um, it was found that you need a set of transcription factors, they're called E2F families now, uh, are needed to transcribe the adenovirus early genes. And those early genes were called the E2 genes of adenovirus, so the transcription factors were called uh, E2F. So these are cellular transcription proteins that are needed to activate synthesis of this viral transcriptional unit. E2F, the E2F family, was found to bind a cellular protein called RB, the retinoblastoma protein. And we're going to see in a moment, all of these turn out to be incredibly important in regulating the cell cycle. Just like entry into mitosis is stimulated by oncogenes, proto-oncogenes. Now you're going to see how these proteins regulate passage of the cell cycle. So here's our cell cycle again, uh, which we looked at before. Here we have mitosis shown at the top, which occurs in the M phase, of course. So you do mitosis, then you have a little uh, resting point. There's a restriction point, which we'll talk about in a moment, where the cells can divide whether to proceed or not to synthesis, and then you divide. So the, remember, the retroviruses revealed to us how the go, no-go decision is made up at, up at G0. How the decision is made to go through mitosis. This depends on whether there are growth factors in the, in the medium. And I like it this way. Is the outside world rich enough to replicate the cell? So if growth factors bind the receptor and send a signal into the nucleus, then the cell will go through mitosis. And though those pathway, again, was discovered by retrovirus, studying retroviruses, which is what it says. Here. Okay, so this is the first control point in the cell cycle. There's a second control point down here, which is regulated by RB this protein discovered to bind E2F. It is the master regulator of the decision to go forward or not. Uh, by the way, retinoblastoma protein was originally discovered in kids who have tumors of retinoblasts. These are cells that go on to form cells of the retina. They are finished by five years of age, so these kids get tumors at a very young age that develop in the eye and a major protein in this tumor is the RB protein. That's why it's called RB. Uh, it is what we call a recessive oncogene. Now, the, the proto-oncogenes picked up by retroviruses are dominant because if you express those in cells, they make the cells go through mitosis. These are recessive because when they are expressed, they stop the cells from going through mitosis at this checkpoint past G1. If you mutate them so they lose their function, then the cell can proceed through this checkpoint. So that's why we call them recessive. So that's the restriction point, and it's RB that decides whether the cell will go through it or not. So how does this work? How does RB decide whether the cells can keep going through the next phase, which is DNA synthesis? So when you have a, a cell and there's some growth factors in the medium, so here are these little yellow spheres are growth factors. They're binding to a growth factor receptor, and then they start a signaling pathway that ends up turning on genes in the nucleus. And remember, all the genes in this pathway were discovered in retroviruses. If the growth factors are present, you end up getting phosphorylation of RB, retinoblastoma protein. When RB is phosphorylated, then the cells go into the S phase. If it's not phosphorylated, the cells will stop and never go into synthesis until RB is phosphorylated. So that's the checkpoint for proceeding into DNA synthesis. All right, so you got mitogens binding, phosphorylation of RB, the cells go on. But under certain conditions, RB is not phosphorylated, and you'll see uh, what that is in a moment. So you might be wondering, why does phosphorylation of RB make the cells divide? Well, it's pretty complicated, but I can simplify it for you here. RB 
normally in, in a non-phosphorylated state binds the E2F transcription proteins, makes them inactive. These uh, E2F transcription proteins are needed to, to transcribe genes that are needed for cell division and DNA synthesis, make it simple. So if RB is not phosphorylated, it sequesters E2F, so you can't get DNA synthesis, you can't proceed through the cell cycle. When RB is phosphorylated, it pops off of E2F. Here's RB. Now E2F is free to turn on the genes and push the cell through DNA synthesis. It can now pass the checkpoint, make DNA, and go back up to mitosis again. All right. So the, the growth factors are binding to the receptor. Eventually, they, they signal to RB. If RB is phosphorylated, the cells can make DNA. If it's not phosphorylated, if, if things are not right, then the cell stops at the checkpoint. So that's how RB controls it. So the cells potentially could be arrested at that checkpoint. But when a DNA virus infects a cell, what does it want the cell to be doing? It wants to be replicating its DNA. It needs the factors needed for DNA synthesis. Some of the viruses need the polymerase, but they also need other proteins as well. So when a DNA virus comes in a cell, it kicks it into S phase. It bypasses the restriction imposed by RB. And in fact, that's what T antigens do. That's their function, to push the cells. If they're sitting at the checkpoint before DNA synthesis, the T antigens push it and say, start making DNA. We need DNA to be made in order to replicate our genomes. So that's the connection between T antigens and the cell cycle. So what do T antigens do to do this? Well, here's the same figure I just showed you. Here's RB bound up to E2F. So E2F is inactive, has to be separated by phosphorylation in order to get DNA synthesis. Well, let's say a virus comes into a cell and RB is not phosphorylated. It makes a T antigen. Any one of those DNA viral encoded T antigens is shown up here as the purple kidney. The T antigen binds RB and gets it off of the E2F. So it mimics phosphorylation of RB. Now we have free two E2F. It can turn on the genes needed for DNA synthesis. So the viral T antigens, SV40T, adenovirus T, papilloma, polyoma T, this is what they do. They bypass the checkpoint control imposed by RB so they can get their genomes replicated. Now adenovirus has one additional requirement. Remember the E2F transcription factors were initially discovered because an adenovirus promoter needs them. So ADD, in addition to wanting the cells to be making DNA, also wants these E2F proteins. Those are the uh, purple, uh, what is this color? Beige, that's the beige one here. It needs it to transcribe its genes. So it has two reasons for getting RB off of E2F, to replicate its genome and to make transcripts as well. All right, there's one more checkpoint control. I've told you about <laughs> RB. But there's another protein. You must be thinking, what happened to P53? Well, P53 is another checkpoint down there at the same place where RB is working. P53 monitors the cells for damaged DNA or unscheduled DNA synthesis. All right? So if a virus is infecting a cell, that's unscheduled DNA synthesis. And P53's normal role is to see if we have any DNA damage in our genome. And if we do, it stops the cell cycle at that checkpoint before DNA synthesis goes on so that the cell can repair that damage. This is why so many human tumors have mutations in P53, because they pre it prevents stopping the checkpoint when DNA damage is present. So P53 is another major player. It recognizes DNA damage. It recognizes viral DNA replication intermediates as abnormal, unscheduled DNA synthesis. In a virus-infected cell, if the virus is making a T antigen that has bound RB, and if E2F is free, P53 will sense that, and it induces apoptosis. P53 is a pro-apoptotic protein. Remember apoptosis and intrinsic defense? Now you see how apoptosis is triggered. P53 senses that viral replication is going on, and it puts a break 
on the cell cycle. I won't tell you how P53 does that. It's pretty complicated. I think you can see that not only do viruses, DNA viruses, have to counter RB so they can get through the cell cycle, they also have to counter P53. Otherwise, the cells will die from apoptosis and they won't proceed uh, through the checkpoint. So how do they do that? A number of different ways summarized on this slide. Here's P53 in purple. And these, again, these viruses, adenopapilloma, polyoma, they all make T antigens. The T antigens antagonize P53. Um, the uh, E6 T antigen of papilloma viruses uh, binds P53 and makes it get ubiquitinated, which signals it for degradation by the proteasome. Brilliant. So now P53 cannot push the cells into apoptosis. Uh, SV40 large T sequesters P53. It just binds it, and P53 cannot turn on apoptosis. And the adenovirus T antigens also, they sequester or degrade, uh, lead to the degradation of P53. So now we've gotten rid of RB and P53. We can go through the cell cycle. And the virus, of course, needs this to replicate. But what does this have to do with transformation? Well, we have two more things to explain, and when we do, then you'll see the answer to that question. First, why is everything turned off in a transformed cell? Why is everything except T antigens turned off in a transformed cell? And why is transformation rare? Okay, and that will answer the question that I've just posed. And the answer is uh, transformation is rare because it involves two extremely low probability events. First of all, the late viral genes cannot be expressed because these encode capsid proteins and these will make virions which will then uh, help to kill the cell and, and lyse it and that'll be the end. So you can't have a transformed cell. So in a transformed cell, you can't make late genes. The way this happens is there's a deletion of the late genes spontaneously happening, which removes them, or the virus infects semi-permissive cells, where there is no late de genes by definition. So when a monkey virus infects a hamster or a mouse, it's semi-permissive. You get early gene expression. You get T antigen made, but you don't get late gene expression, so you don't get virions produced. And secondly, T antigen has to be turned on all the time. That's what will make the cells divide continuously. So what happens is, the, the DNA encoding these viral T antigens gets integrated into the host cell. This is completely an accident. Anytime you put foreign DNA into a nucleus, a little bit of, is, of it is going to get just randomly integrated. It happens all the time. This has nothing to do with the life cycle of these viruses. It's, t it's DNA being accidentally integrated. And if that piece of DNA happens to encode T antigen, then the cells are in trouble because they're going to start dividing and never stop. The T antigen is going to counter RB, it's going to counter P53, and the cells are going to just keep going around the cell cycle. That's why these T antigens alone can transform cells. They have the properties of kicking cells through the cell cycle. That's needed by the virus. But in the absence of the rest of the viral genome, that leads to transformation. All right, so our last question. How do DNA tumor viruses transform cells? All right, so the answer is not by integrating next to oncogenes, that's RNA tumor viruses. By insertion in, of oncogenes in the viral genome, that's RNA tumor viruses. By antagonizing RB and P53, that is how they transform cells. They do not transactivate oncogenes. That's what RNA tumor viruses do. So the only way that DNA tumor viruses do it is to antagonize these checkpoint proteins because they need to for the purposes of their DNA synthesis. And if just T antigen is expressed in the cell, the, the result is transformation. So transformation and the subsequent tumor formation that may occur because the cells keep dividing are accidents. They're epigenetic processes because these viruses have to kick the cells into dividing. You do not need to transform a cell in order for adeno or SV40 or polyomas, papillomas to replicate. It's an accident of their life cycles. So DNA viruses have to start 
DNA synthesis. This is the third time I've said it, but it's really important to emphasize it. That is, a, that is achieved by T antigen, which pushes the cell into the synthetic phase by inactivating P53 and RB. RB inactivation allows the cell to go into S. P53 prevents inactivation, prevents apoptosis. And so I think you can see if you prevent lysis of the cell by not having late gene expression, and you express T antigens, the cells are going to be transformed. They will be immortal and keep dividing forever and on their way to uh, being oncogenic. So that's summarized here. Here's again our cell cycle. We know now its initiation into G0, mitosis, is pushed by the mitogenic pathway, the components of which were identified as dominant oncogenes in transforming retroviruses. The growth factors in the medium, the receptors, all the signaling proteins, those are all oncogenes picked up by retroviruses. Now, if you have a growth factor in the medium, it starts the cell going through the cycle, but then there is a second checkpoint down here before the cycle goes into the DNA synthetic phase. Uh, that is controlled by RB and P53. They want to make sure conditions are right before allowing the cell to make more DNA. And now we know, we know of P53 and RB and how they work by studying DNA viruses uh, that in, inactivate them. Yes? But how does this affect contact inhibition? I thought contact inhibition is part of the definition of a transformed cell. Right. Well, the continuous, so, so part of that is the continuous division. So there's, there's, there's a feedback pathway that happens when cells touch, and that's abrogated because the cells are continuously given a signal to divide. And that's basically, they, they divide and they pile up on top of each other. So DNA tumor viruses, RNA tumor viruses basically elucidated this cell control path, which is amazing. I find this incredible, but this is what viruses do. Of course, we now understand how cells get transformed. And there are some human tumors uh, induced by viruses, as I said earlier. And components of what I told you today are responsible for those transformations as well. So just think, it all began with a chicken. <laughs>